thanks everyone for for joining in. Um, this is my first kind of webinar that I've done. So please, if you have trouble understanding me or I go too fast, please let me know um, so that you can get as much out of this as possible. Um, so I uh, operate New Morning Farm. We're in South Central Pennsylvania and uh, we're an organic vegetable farm and it's actually quite an old organic vegetable farm. Um, it was founded in 1972 uh, by Jim and Moe Crawford. So I came in 11 years ago with no experience as an apprentice and I basically learned everything I know from this farm and lots of other farms in this room. Um, so I am always talking from my experience, but process, my, my thought process that I use. You're cutting, sorry, to, Jennifer. You're cutting out just a little bit. So I don't know if it's the internet or if it's the microphone. Yeah. Just. It might be the internet. Is that okay. better? Yeah. Yep. But I'll, um, I'll interject if we need to, if you need to repeat anything, but I think you're good for right now. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, but I'm hoping that the thought process that I use, you guys can take and apply to your challenges that you see in your region. So um, that's another thing to be sensitive to is that I'm in a different region. And even though we're growing the same vegetable crops, the way, like the pressure that you experience and even some of the best specifically that you experience may be different from my experience. Uh, being said, uh, we do about 32 acres of organic vegetables. We are aimed at retail farmers markets um, and we pretty much go year round. So we uh, grow in the spring for May and June start and then we're growing all summer and fall for summer, fall, and winter farmers markets. We have done some wholesale marketing, but that is on the decline. We're focusing a lot more on the farmers markets, and we rely heavily on season extension and succession plantings. Um, so our goal is always to have reliable, sufficient, high quality variety at our markets. Um, so we do lots of different crops. We do lots of plantings of each crop usually. Um, we do 24 plantings of field lettuce. We also do more lettuce in the tunnel. We do four or five plantings of tomatoes, depending on the tomato. Um, we do 18 plantings of sweet corn. Um, and things generally follow that trend. So we are a busy place. And with so many different crops, we also have a lot of different pests that we face. So how can we minimize our marketable yield loss to these pests? So how can we maximize our marketable yield? So some principles to pest management. Basically, in a nutshell, that means about what's going on and trying something that you think might help, observing results, and then doing the whole thing over again. So it's, it's that cycle of, of um, working to manage your pests. So history is really important. Um, what problems have you seen? And many of you have shared some history that you've had. Um, things that you've seen that were problems. That's really, really valuable. Um, and what, on what crops that can suggest, you know, what other crops might have problems. And then context. So um, is it in the spring or the fall? Or is it all year? Or um, is it, we've had problems in the chard with spotted cucumber beetles but only when the chard is planted near the summer squash. So if we just keep the chard away from the summer squash, we don't have that problem at all. So knowing that kind of story for your crop and um, 
using that history to minimize your problems. So identification is super important. Whether it's a pest or a disease, as you're learning these things, it's really, really invaluable to have someone else confirm your identification. Um, if your identification is off, probably the, your management strategies are going to be less effective. So prevention is key in organic agriculture. Um, our methods and materials usually work when we're preventing the problem. Once you have a, pro a significant problem or a problem, often we can't really. Um, you're going to have to. to sorry, you're going to have to repeat a little bit of that there. I was just uh, speaking on prevention. Um, if you if once you have a problem with our organic methods and materials you won't get you to your maximum yield probably you can mitigate that problem but you won't you won't get to your maximum yields and then um, it's also really important to understand your materials or biocontrols that you're choosing to use if you do so so um, Many of our materials are actually biological based and work best in certain conditions and may not work at all in other conditions. And your biocontrols, they're living things too. So they have their own set of needs in terms of habitat or food or um, temperatures or daylight. And so there are people who can tell you all of these different things. So this is a, a model or a theory about when does a pest or disease happen on our vegetables. And you basically need three things to have a, a problem. You need the host, so you need the vegetable crop present. You need the pathogen or pest present on your farm. And then you need the environment to be correct for that pathogen or pest. And when you have all three of those things, then you have a problem. Then you have a pest outbreak or then you have a disease. So a great example is uh, cucurbit downy mildew, which is a disease. And if you don't have any susceptible cucurbits on your farm, you won't have this disease. Um, this disease also blows in on the winds. It blows up from the south every year, usually either Florida or Texas. Um, and so there are certain years when it doesn't blow up on the, on the air currents and it just won't be around and you won't have disease. Um, it also, it requires a certain dew point and also I believe it requires a certain length of darkness in order to reproduce. So if you were able to control those things, maybe by putting your cucurbits in a tunnel, you might make the environment unfavorable and then you wouldn't have disease. Um, aphids would be a insect example. So certain aphids like broadleaf plants, which most of our vegetables are broadleaves. Certain aphids only like cereals or grasses or trees. So um, you need an aphid that is going to be a problem on your vegetable crop. You need both of those present. And then also aphids actually thrive in cooler temperatures. So the environment has to be correct. Um, aphids digest the plant sap because they have a microbe in their guts that allows them to do so. When temperatures go above about 75 degrees, that microbe shuts down and aphids can actually starve to death um, even when they're still drinking plant fluid. So that's yeah, why you often don't see aphids in the height of the summer. They're more of a spring, fall, winter problem because that environment in the summer is just not favorable. So here at New Morning Farm, we 
think about disease, pest and disease as kind of one thing. Um, we often will do management strategies for both at the same time. Um, so for many of our diseases, I think of them as kind of micro pests. Um, and I actually think through a very similar process that I do for larger pests like insects. So um, for a disease, we could manage, we could choose to manage one or all of those points in the triangle. So a, a great place to start is that susceptible host. In organic agriculture, if we can get a resistant variety, we have a huge advantage over um, a non-resistant variety. Um, another thing you can do is plant to kind of minimize the window that we think the disease might be present. So if we can plant maybe a cucurbit very early in the spring that is gonna mature very early before the disease pathogen shows up, that might be a way of uh, minimizing having that susceptible host on the farm when the disease is there because you've already gotten your crop and it's already out. Um, so uh, if a keeping a disease off your farm is a great idea. We, we've gone heavily to hot water seed treatment. Um, I think what I've observed is as more and more of our vegetable seed is organic, which is great, we also were seeing more pressure coming in on our vegetable seed. So um, there are good lists of uh, diseases that are seed borne and they're actually inside the seed coat. So the hot water treatment is trying to kill those diseases inside the seed coat. Um, and we found that to be really helpful in minimizing disease pressure on everything from brassicas to tomatoes, um, even onions, and basically everything that we can heat treat, we've been heat treating. Another way to minimize um, your pathogen presence is to put your crop in a place where uh, it hasn't been before so that if there are any soil borne pathogens or pathogens on decaying crop residues, it's not the same crop that you have trying to grow there. So then uh, environment, you might decide to space your plants differently. Um, maybe you're thinking more airflow or um, you might space them in such a way that you, this, if you're going to spray, the sprayer can get better coverage. Um, and then high tunnel, many people are finding high tunnels really helpful because you have more control. It's not going to rain in the high tunnel all the time. And then irrigation methods. When we are irrigating, we're creating uh, a humidity or leaf wetness that wouldn't necessarily be there without that irrigation. So we uh, drip irrigate our most susceptible brassicas, the ones we have the most trouble with, and then we overhead irrigate our brassicas that, like kale and broccoli, that seem to do just fine with overhead. Can we get your points on? Jennifer. Um, yes. I, you have to repeat that last sentence for us. Okay. Um, so you can manage each of the points on that triangle and um, that's what we do. We try to manage all of them and kind of shrink that whole triangle down. So macro pests, um, these might be insects or nematodes or mites or groundhogs or snails or slugs. Um, you, can, you can do the same thing. You can kind of go around that triangle and, and decide how you're gonna manage things. So with um, insects maybe, uh, exclusion can be really helpful. So just putting a barrier in the way and keeping them out. Um, invisibility. So how can you make your host crop 
invisible to that pest. Um, and, or, and you might just choose to have a non-host crop. We have actually chosen to stop growing certain things because they're just too beloved of the pest. Um, so for managing the pest, with these ones, they were really thinking about how to interrupt their life cycle and prevent a population explosion. For many of these, you're always gonna have a few around. They're always gonna be there. And that often can be okay to have a very low level. It's when they really explode that we have problems. So then your environment, um, you, you might look outside your production fields and notice that um, like maybe if you had really tall, weedy edges on your field, it's a great place for a groundhog to feel really comfortable. And so the groundhog is coming into your patch and eating all of your lettuce. So you might choose to mow around your field. Um, you may also choose to mow wild hosts. If you had like one patch of a wild host that was a source of an insect pest, you may choose to mow it. Often those wild hosts are too distributed to actually mow them off and control them. On the other hand, you might plant kind of wild hosts to host a pest at a modest level that would then host natural enemies of that pest so that those natural enemies were always around as well. If you always have the pest around, you probably always have the natural enemies around too. And if that balance is correct, it's usually fine. So what are, that's kind of the theories. Um, so what are some things you might actually do to be able to use this every day? So um, scouting and observing, um, sometimes my best scouting is when I'm working in a crop. So I'm harvesting or weeding or uh, trellising. Oftentimes that's when I actually see the most things. Um, that's really key. You have to be able to see what's going on in order to be able to make management changes. Correct identification and then having the correct life cycle is really key to managing a pest. With pests and diseases, oftentimes they're very similar looking critters, pests, that actually are quite different and need different management practices. Um, recording your observations is super helpful. It's really hard to remember all of the details from one year to the next. And um, this definitely is an iterative process where you want to have some even quick notes of what happened last year, the timing, how bad it was, um, just being able to tell that story to yourself again so that this coming year you can make plans to get ahead of it and prevent the problem before it starts. Use human resources. So like this webinar is great, um, but uh, you know, other farmers in your area, they will know a lot more details about the pests that they're used to, the timing of those pests, and then strategies that may be working for them to minimize those pests. And then at some point we all understand that it may still be beyond our ability to control. So we can work really hard and still it doesn't work. The pest or disease takes the crop. Um, but here at New Morning Farm, we really take the proactive approach and usually we feel like we're successful. So some techniques that we might use um, 
timing of a crop to avoid a pest. We do this um, in our cucurbit crops, our winter squash. We plant our winter squash super early so that it's actually harvested early and out of the field before cucurbit downy mildew makes it up the east coast. Um, we can do the same thing with potatoes here often where we'll plant them very early and actually get our crop harvested before late blight really takes hold. Uh, cultural practices. So this is anything to do with the system you use to grow your crop. So it could be location, arrangement of plantings, like don't put the chard next to the summer squash. Um, crop rotation, exclusion, um, maybe using row cover. Are you growing these vegetables on plastic or without plastic? And how does that plastic affect that microclimate around the crop? Um, and what does that mean for your pest or disease? Plant spacing can be helpful to adjust. Weed control can be really key. Um, if you have a field of broccoli and there's lots of gallon soga that's starting to flower in that broccoli, that can pull in tarnished plant bugs um, that will then go for the broccoli. Whereas if you had a really clean broccoli field, your tarnished plant bugs would stay out in your hedgerows and probably wouldn't come into the broccoli. Um, what is the surrounding environment? Are there hedgerows? They can be, they can be good or bad. Um, and your irrigation method also is a cultural practice that may encourage or discourage a pest or disease. So then we have spray materials. And this is often where people, uh, we often think about this first, but really this is often later in the process um, after we've thought through the other techniques. They still are key often, but um, they don't necessarily work just by themselves with our organic materials. Um, the story is a little different with conventional materials. So um, at this point, I was going to start going through a few examples. So far, I'd be happy to start hearing them and. Um, yeah, I'll work through a couple examples. So um, we grow a lot of green beans here. We do, I think it's 18 plantings a year. So we have beans in the ground starting in May and we go all the way through late October, almost November. So we have a lot of potential for the Mexican bean beetle. Um, it, arrives at the farm every year. It also blows up from the south. We're just a little bit north of where it overwinters. Um, but we know it gets to us every year sometime in June, usually mid to late June. So we're ready. We're looking for it um, at that time. And um, what we do for it, as soon as we see it arrive, we look for the egg masses. Those are those little yellow clusters of dots on the other side, under side of the leaf. And as soon as we see those, we call the New Jersey Department of Agriculture because they produce and sell a lot So it's called Phobius Harvest. And we buy this. Jennifer, can you just repeat? Sorry, Jennifer, can you just repeat okay. what it is that the New Jersey Department of Ag produces? Because you cut out a little bit there. Sure, it's a little wasp, so it's, it's a parasitoid, um, Pediobius faviolatus. And what it does is that wasp will find the larvae, which is the yellow spiky things in the picture, um, 
and it will actually lay its eggs into the larvae and then um, the larvae is killed by those developing parasites and adult parasites emerge out of it and go on to find more Mexican bean beetle larvae. So we're able to do one or maybe two releases of this parasite in June, July, and then we see a few Mexican bean beetles after that, but we almost, it's, ne it's almost never a problem. I think maybe one year in the past 20 years have we had anything like a problem. And that's all we have to do. Now I think because of our isolated location, we have fairly low pressure. So this may not be sufficient for other farms, but it definitely works for us. So we have a question from uh, David Allen, and he asked, is uh, the foveolatus specific to Mexican bean beetle? I believe it is, and it does not survive the winter here. So that's why we need to buy it in every June. Um, I don't think it has any other hosts. Great, thanks. Yeah, Mexican bean beetle is actually like one of the only herbivorous lady beetles. It's actually a lady beetle. Um, so it's not related to like a Colorado potato beetle. It's a different, it's a different thing. So sweet corn and two main so we have the European corn borer and then uh, the corn earworm. So uh, we treat them kind of individually, um, but it's all wrapped into our system for sweet corn. So for European corn borer, we know that we get it every year and it's pretty much always here in the spring, ready to go as soon as the first corn is. Um, so we know from our history just to expect that. The corn earworm is different. It blows up from the south where it overwinters on the air currents. And historically, it often didn't arrive until mid-July, late July. But in recent years, it's pretty much been here as soon as the corn season starts. So that's a history that is changing for us. Um, we're having high pressure from both of these now, right off the bat. So for European corn borer, the first thing we do is we release another parasitoid. It's Trichogramma ostriniae, and it's available um, to purchase here on the East Coast from IPM Laboratories. Um, and so we release this, it comes on a little card, we hang it out in the cornfield, when the corn is actually 12 to 16 inches high. So you think like, wow, like that corn is quite small, but that's actually when the European corn borer eggs are being laid on that corn. And trichogramma, again, goes after the eggs. So you need it there when the eggs are actually being laid. Um, so we just do that as a matter of course. Because of our history, we know we need to release these trichogramma. Every planting, when it's the right size. Um, then at whirl stage, just before the corn sends up a tassel, we go and scout and look for feeding damage of any European corn borer worms that escaped that parasitoid. If we see some damage, then we will use a BT spray, usually usually dipel um, at row tassel. And if we get that timing right, um, we pretty much have worm-free corn 90% of the time. 10% of the time that European corn borer for the planting will be at a moderate level in the ears. Um, So then for corn earworm, we do something called zeolation, where we, um, at the correct time, which is just as the 
silks are starting to dry, so pollination has just finished, we inject a half a mil of corn oil into every single silk, and then we use spinosad or entrust in there as well. Um, the corn earworm lays its eggs on silk, and so we want to create a physical barrier. It's like a suffocating barrier between that little tiny worm that's hatching in those silks before it can get to the tip of the ear. That's quite labor intensive, but for us, with the size of plantings that we do and the weather that we have, I think it still makes more sense than spraying every three to five days. Oh, great, I have some more. So um, this is more about that zealation. So um, adults are moths, and both of these are actually nocturnal. So you won't usually see that you have a bunch of moths flying around your cornfield because it's all happening at night. Um, there are traps available for these, um, but, and if you don't have a history, it might be a great idea to use a trap so you can build that history faster. We're, we pretty much know what's gonna happen based on our long history. Um, so, right, so adults lay eggs on the silks and then we put, um, we put the corn oil right in the top of the ear so that these little guys die before they get down to the ear. So another example for us would be transplant production. Um, so here we have many, many different crops but they're all moving through our greenhouse. They're all planted in a potting soil, in plug trays. Um, so we have a history of fungus gnats in the spring and then aphids also in the spring and sometimes late in the fall. So for the fungus gnats, it is a gnat or a fly. And so it's actually quite resistant to most of the kind of organic spray materials that that we have available. And also being a fly, flies tend to develop resistance fairly quickly. So if we were to choose to spray or apply something repeatedly, we might find that our material didn't work pretty quickly. So we start from the beginning. Those fungus gnats are probably living in the floor, either in the gravel or in um, the kind of silty potting soil that's built up underneath the gravel. And so every spring we inoculate the floor with a predatory beetle to eat all kinds of things down there and to keep that fungus gnat population under control. The next thing we do is we actually apply a mite to those crops that will be kind of in the greenhouse for a long time. So um, our onion starts that we start in uh, late January or early February, um, or our slow germinating crops like parsley or celeriac or celery or fennel. Those things that are in the greenhouse for a long time are an opportunity for the fungus gnats to do multiple generations and really build up a damaging population. And so we actually purchase a mite um, that it's a predatory mite that will eat fungus gnat eggs, and we just scatter it over the tops of those trays, and pretty much we haven't had any problem. But that's all done ahead. That's all done before there's a problem. Once you have, um, you know, little tiny gnats hovering over your trays, and their, their larvae, their maggots are down in the tray eating your roots, to a point where you can notice it, it's already pretty late in the game and problem, but definitely gonna have damage from it.
So for the aphids, we use another parasitoid, another little wasp. And what we actually do for this one, um, we could purchase it every week because we have plants moving through here every week, new plants being seeded, getting taken out to the fields. But what we do actually is we grow a barley plant in a pot, a one or two gallon pot, and we have maybe three or four of them. We grow barley to grow a cereal aphid. So um, most of our vegetables are broadleafs and this cereal aphid won't feed off of a broadleaf. So we grow barley to grow an aphid to host our parasitoid. Um, and then we actually are growing our own population of parasitoids um, for two or three months in the spring when the aphid pressure would be higher. And we also have a lot of transplants. So we're, these, these banker plants, these barley plants, are constantly having little parasitoids emerge on them, fly out and scout our greenhouse and pick off any susceptible aphids that they do find. So you still need to scout because this little parasitoid does a couple species of aphids and they happen to be our most common aphids, but we can get two or three other species fairly regularly that this little parasitoid won't handle. And we have to see that that happens and need to take another measure. So for us, tunnel cucumbers is kind of an interesting system. Um, we only started doing tunnel cucumbers about six years ago. And really we started because the cucurbit downy mildew pressure suddenly went sky high. Um, basically cucurbit downy mildew overcame the resistance that was present in all of our cucumber varieties and became a big problem. So we decided to put some cucumbers in our high tunnel so that they were in an environment that was less favorable to cucurbit downy mildew development. When we did this, it gave us an opportunity, well, tunnel cucumbers are really great hosts for aphids, thrips, spider mite, and on some farms, white fly. And um, in, we, we have cucumber beetles, striped cucumber beetles all over. And normally, if we had striped cucumber beetles present in our tunnel cucumbers, we would need to spray our organic materials quite aggressively to just manage those cucumber beetles that spray may or may not also manage the other pests, the aphids, thrips, spider mites, and white fly. But uh, the tunnel we were gonna put these in, and we have put these in, happens to be screened. So it does not have roll-up sides, it has big powered fans, and we have window screen across the intakes. So what that does is it keeps the cucumber beetles out, so they're excluded. We don't have to worry about them, really. If one gets in, we see it and we just grab it and squish it. Um, and that leaves space to use biocontrols on aphids and thrips. Especially. Um, so the first step for us in the system is having a screened tunnel where we're just excluding those cucumber beetles. And once we've done that, we use uh, a preventive program, a combination of um, mites in the soil and on the plant to control the thrips at the egg stage and at the pupil stage. And then we use midges, it's a little fly to con as a generalist aphid predator, so it basically attacks all aphids. And then we use that aphid parasitoid that we use in the greenhouse 
to control other aphids. Um, so by excluding the cucumber beetles, which we would basically have to spray, by taking them out of the system, by getting that key pest out of the way, then we can do some pretty neat stuff with these other biocontrols. And basically, I can pretty much go a whole summer and I may have to spot spray for aphids once or twice. If I do my scouting well and I see like the hot spots start to build up, I can spray just those spots and knock those back and our biocontrols can take care of the rest of the tunnel. So cucumber beetles, I think this is uh, a common challenge for many, many people. Um, the first question is, which cucumber beetle? So um, striped or spotted? The spotted cucumber beetle is also known as southern corn rootworm. It has a very wide host range and it has completely different um, techniques that you might use to manage it. But the striped cucumber beetle is specific to cucurbits. So cucumbers, squashes, pumpkins, um, and it's a tough one. It is a large, hard-bodied <laughs> insect that is a vector for disease, and it does have other hosts. So if there's no cucurbits around, it will go into the hedgerow and feed on the foliage or pollen of things like goldenrod or apple trees, willow trees, um, um, for life cycle, it varies by region, but generally um, adults overwinter and they emerge in the spring and there are actually models for degree days, um, how many degree days have to accumulate for it, for the adults to start to emerge. Um, once the adults emerge, they need to find some cucurbits and mate and then they'll lay their eggs at the base of the cucurbit in the soil and the grubs or larvae will feed on the cucurbit's roots and then emerge, pupate and emerge as an adult. Where I am, we only do one generation a year, so those adults will then spend their late summer and fall feeding to fatten up to survive the winter and do the process again next year. Um, further south, you can have two or even extreme south, three life cycles a year, but we're just dealing with one. So this really is a tricky one. Um, they're mobile. I don't know if you ever tried to spray these guys, but they're really great at flying up just before the spray boom or just before your sprayer wand and flying over into the hedgerow and waiting for four or 12 hours and then coming back when your spray is no longer uh, effective. Um, they're also great at moving themselves around from, from plant to plant. They have that large hard body, so um, they're large. It's hard to hit them with enough material to, to make a, a difference to actually kill them. They're particularly damaging because they can vector disease, especially um, bacterial wilt uh, to cucumbers in particular. So what do we do? Um, getting our plants as much of a head start as we can give them. With this head start, we can often get most of our yield, even if we have some of these guys around. So we transplant all of our cucurbits. We grow them in the greenhouse. It's a screened greenhouse. These guys can't get in. And then when we do transplant them outside, we row cover the most susceptible ones, our cucumbers. We row cover them 
until they start to flower. So we give them two or three weeks of growing outside in the field without pressure from these guys because the row cover stays in between. For our winter squash, which we do on a larger scale, we do half an acre of winter squash, we try to make them invisible when we transplant them. So I will spray them with kale and clay, uh, it's called surround, and this kaolin makes them less visible, but it also seems to irritate and just make the striped cucumber beetle itchy. Um, so they spend more time hopefully cleaning themselves and trying to get this clay off them than they do feeding on the plants. Um, of course, if it rains, I need to go out there and put that clay back on, so spray that clay back on. And I do this um, again for the first two or three weeks until those little winter squash plants have really jumped up hopefully into medium size to large squash plants. So then if you think about the life cycle of this pest, um, the adults are large and, and tough to get. They lay their eggs down in the soil so there's not really a time when their eggs are exposed but they do have a portion of their life cycle when they are soft and juicy and in the soil. Um, so that may be the best time to control your population. So what we've tried before, um, and the timing can be tricky, is apply entomopathogenic nematodes through our drip irrigation, but you could drench them on to the soil when we know that those larvae are down there. And that won't help you really for your like current problem, but it may knock the population back for next year. Um, anything you can do really to encourage your other natural enemies, so spiders, um, different assassin bugs, um, anything you can do to create a good habitat for them will also, they will eat these guys if they have a good habitat. But yeah, these are a tough one. So flea beetles, um, the first question is, we have three species, I believe, here at New Morning Farm. Um, so we have two that uh, prefer brassicas, and then we have one that prefers solanaceous. Um, and I actually wonder if we don't have a new one um, come in because our timing, the pressure of our timing of the pressure from flea beetles is changing. It's getting longer in the fall. Our, the pressure used to drop off in late August and we could plant our radishes and um, turnips outside and they'd be fine. And we're finding that we really can't do that anymore until September or even mid-September. Um, so is anyone familiar with the life cycle of a flea beetle? Anyone on the line familiar? I feel like there probably is at least one person out there. I don't know, Jennifer, maybe you're just gonna have to tell yeah. them all about it. So it's actually quite similar to the striped cucumber beetle. They overwinter as adults. And then in the spring, they're gonna feed on all of your spring brassicas. And there are many wild, wild brassicas around us in the spring, or wild crucifers at least, which our brassica flea beetles will feed on. 
Um, they're going to lay their eggs at the base of the plant. And um, for us, the new adults will emerge in the first or second week of July. So we actually have a, a, a break in flea beetle damage from about early June to early July. And then we get that new generation of flea beetles emerging and it's really hard there in July. Um, so those, for us, those adults emerge and they're feeding um, for the rest of the summer, trying to fatten up to survive the winter. So challenges, also pretty similar to the striped cucumber beetle. They have, they're not as large, but they do have that hard body. They're extremely mobile. They jump like fleas. And um, they're actually really hard to kill outright with our organic materials. So like you could catch these guys and put them in a jar and you know put some of our organic materials in there and like shake it up, dump them out into a, a box for a few hours and they might feel sick but they won't usually die outright. So they're again a really tough pest to just think you're gonna go spray them and it's gonna solve the problem. So what do we do? We pretty much try to minimize brassicas in July. So we want that new generation, if they're around, uh, to find no tasty food to eat with us. Um, actually, by having a brassica-free July, it means that we've killed our brassicas while those little uh, larvae are still in the soil and we've tilled it in. So hopefully we've separated them from their brassica root that they've been munching on and they've starved to death and died. Um, so they're not even able to emerge as adults in July. So once a year we have this window where we just say almost no brassicas. It's hard to do no brassicas at all, but very, very few brassicas. So we kind of break the life cycle right there. Now there's lots and lots of wild hosts, so we're never going to be 100% successful. So then for our plants, our brassicas and turnips and radishes are most susceptible as tiny plants. So even a, for us, kind of a medium infestation of flea beetles will actually mow down emerging turnip or radish plants when they have those little baby leaves. They'll just make them vanish. It's amazing. So we transplant. We grow them in a greenhouse um, where we can keep those flea beetles out. For some reason, we seem to have no flea beetle pressure or very little in our greenhouse. Um, we get a plant up and growing and it's three or four inches tall and then we put it out to where the flea beetles might get it. Um, many people use exclusion for these guys with row cover. Um, sprays, as I said, are really hard to make work. Occasionally, I will do a spray if the pressure on the transplants is high enough and I think they just need a day or two without pressure to kind of jump ahead of the flea beetles. Once you get a new reasonable sized plant, the flea beetles might chew on it a little bit, but they're not actually going to damage your final yield. So most of my experience almost all of my experience is with the brassica flea beetle. Um, there is a solanaceous flea beetle and that loves eggplant. And I am not experienced with that one, but exclusion is a wonderful thing. So imported cabbage worm is and then other worms present. Sorry, Jennifer, you're going to have to repeat the import, the beginning to this slide. Okay, so imported cabbage worm is 
our most uh, populous worm. Um, we do have others. We have the cabbage looper. We have the diamondback moth. We have a couple others, but pretty much for us, we scout and control the cabbage worm and the other things are controlled as well. Um, so for the cabbage worm, for us, again, it's something that is around here all the time. It has multiple generations a year, um, at least three are, and um, it has lots and lots of wild hosts. So it's just gonna be something we're always working at. So for us, um, the adults, I believe they overwinter as pupae, but we see them early in the spring. They're these little white butterflies and they're really cute. They'll be flying across all the early to uh, emerge wild mustards. And when I see that in the spring, I know it's time to start scouting for imported cabbage worm. Um, then they go through a process of laying their egg on our kale usually in the spring and um, hatching into a worm, growing up, pupating, and the adult will emerge, and it happens all over again. And I think that happens for us about three to four times in a season. So for this pest, having like a clean break in the life cycle doesn't matter. The other super mole will fly from all over the place to get to our brassica fields. Um, so I'm not sure how much having that kind of break in brassica population would matter for this pest. So challenges for this one, we have a big juicy worm and it's often deep like up in the broccoli head or the cauliflower head. They can uh, chew into the cabbage head where they're very hard to get at or see. And then we also have the host plant that's a bit of a challenge for a spray because those waxy brassica leaves shed water. So if you spray water, pretty much it all just rolls off. So if you're trying to apply a, a spray in water, it can just roll right off the leaf. Um, so for us, we have an interesting history. I've seen um, big differences from year to year in the pressure. And I'm thinking there's like a four to five year cycle. Um, about three years ago, we had really high imported cabbage worm pressure. I was spraying pretty frequently, uh, maybe four times on the run. Um, but the few Sorry, worms, Jen, could you repeat how often you were spraying? I think I was spraying about four times a, uh, for a planting of broccoli. It was probably once a week um, when, when the eggs were present on the broccoli. And, um, but then I also noticed that inside some of the big worms I was finding while scouting, they were full of some kind of parasite. These little grubs or larvae were in there. And the next spring, the population had totally crashed. And I basically didn't have to do a single spray that whole year on imported cabbage worm. And then slowly, the population is building back up again. So it's an interesting one to scout for. It actually takes way longer to scout for it when you have a very low population because you keep trying to find it and not finding it. Um, when you have a very high population, the scouting is really quick. You go out, you find, you know, five eggs or five little tiny baby worms on 25 plants and you're like, great, it's time to spray. Um, this is a pest that we use BT for. And if we get the timing right and we're spraying uh, newly emerged larvae, so just after they've hatched, it's very effective, very modest, and it's really well. 
what other techniques uh, maybe have you used or do you think you might use on this type of pest? Has anyone used any other techniques for this uh, particular combination? So netting is listed as an option from Dustin. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exclusion is a good one. So row cover, row cover for exclusion of pests such as ICW on broccoli at Iowa State. Yeah, exclusion is, is a big one. I think that many people find works well, um, depending on the area of production. So we do about four acres of, of brassicas in the fall, and that's just more than we wanna row cover. So we rely on the spray, but exclusion is a great option that I know many farmers use. Great, thank you. Oh, here we go. So that summarizes a bit of what I already said. So one interesting thing about scouting for these things or being able to see them actually is it can be tricky to get started because um, kind of the way your eyes learn to see, you have to somehow learn the pattern. Your eyes have to learn like the search image before you're going to be able to see it. Um, so that's where having, you know, going and visiting a farm with someone who's experienced or having someone experienced come to you and being able to go out and look together and um, just having the opportunity to learn from someone whose eyes are trained can be really, really helpful in getting you started. Um, so like when I'm scouting for these eggs, they're tiny, but they stand up off the bottom of the leaf. I can turn over a kale or a broccoli leaf and pretty quickly, like within a second, I know if there's an egg there or not. If you're brand new to it, it's gonna take you maybe 15 seconds to be confident there's no egg there. Um, so if you have the opportunity to, to get a person and have them help you get your eyes trained, then this process can go, go a lot faster and be a lot more satisfying. Um, I mean, the same is true for uh, scouting for disease or just being able to know if that planting is the right color green or if it's a little bit yellow and maybe it's a little bit under fertilized or something like that. Um, so if you do have the opportunity to see these things in real life and start getting your eyes trained, I would encourage you to use it. So um, we have a lot of other species that we might be having problems with. And I go through a similar process. I want to know about the life cycle. Um, when are they reproducing? Where are they spending their time? Um, and then I want to start choosing uh, management strategies kind of on all three points of that original uh, disease or pest diagram. So at this point, um, I'm going to go back through the chat a little bit and see if there's other pests that maybe I can share my experience from. And we did just have a question coming from Laura. She asks, what do you do to manage Galinsoga? I hope I said that oh, so right. <laughs> Galinsoga. Was how I say it. Um, however you say it's fine. Though. Um, yeah, so that's a weed. Um, we cultivate. So um, I love my tine weeder. So that's um, 
it's kind of like a leaf rake, only a little bit bigger, but it's effective on thread stage weeds. So weeds before you see them, if you see them just popping up out of the soil, they're actually too late for a tine weeder really. Um, so um, using a tine weeder about five days, four to five days, depending on the season, after you've, we till our soil, um, that's when you are gonna get that first flush of thread stage weeds. Um, so basically with a tine weeder, I'm kind of stale bedding with the crop in place. Um, so, but then I always have to go through and uh, either use shovels and sometimes do a quick weeding by hand. Often we tolerate a fair bit of it, but in broccoli, after having that tarnished plant bug problem this year, I think we're gonna be more strict on our broccoli. And then Jennifer, do you have your chat box open so that you can read it now? Yes. Okay, all right, so Laura just responded. Okay, so that was the gallon soga. Yes. Yeah, that's another funny thing about weeds is that um, just like an insect pest or a disease, the timing is really interesting and um, you can be cultivating, especially like, I feel like winter squash. I can cultivate the winter squash perfectly and then it's summer and all my summer weeds germinate and they weren't germinating the whole time that I was trying to and able to cultivate them. Um, So yeah, I hear you. Um, maybe f consider uh, irrigating, so really stale bedding, where you actually irrigate to try to get that gallon soga to germinate before your beans go in. Um, and Jennifer, I don't know how much, how many other slides you have, but we're at eight seventeen right now. Um, okay. So maybe this would be a good time to go back through like you were saying the comments to see which sure. pests people had particular questions about and then Dustin also just asked or he mentioned that they have rust fly and it hit their carrots really hard early in the season um, and he's wondering what he can do for a healthier crop of early carrots. Right, rust fly is something I do not have experience with um, I have, we've had a tiny bit here on our farm, but it's never something I've researched. So unfortunately I can't share about that, but um, I know it's a problem and I know there are cultural practices that people try to start with um, to minimize it. I think it is a fly. I think you could exclude it depending on the size of your planting and if that was going to be a good strategy for you. Um, I saw earlier, uh, a couple of folks mentioned Japanese beetles. So the first thing again is uh, make sure it really is a, a Japanese beetle. Um, when I think Japanese beetles and raspberries, it makes perfect sense. We have raspberries and the Japanese beetles love them. We actually use the dual lure and traps um, that are available in just garden centers. We deploy those um, in early June for us when we know the Japanese beetles are just starting to emerge out of the sod and we have a lot of sod surrounding our fields. Um, we place them just downwind of our raspberries. So the wind is going to blow, it's going to blow through the raspberries, blow past the lure, and then blow out over the sod. Um, Japanese beetles fly upwind. So Japanese beetles are going to fly from the sod and they're going to hit those lures first and congregate there and they get trapped before they make it into the raspberries. Um, so we kind of build a little perimeter with traps every hundred feet or so around our raspberries. We do the same thing for basil. 
and okra. They actually really like okra. Um, they do aggregate. So if you have a few Japanese beetles, they make smells and draw in more Japanese beetles. So it's really important to get those traps out there early. So they aggregate at the traps and there's not little clusters of beetles trying to pull them into your crop itself. Um, fairly good job for us. Um, some years are worse than others, but mostly we don't have a problem with Japanese beetles um, really causing big yield impacts on our raspberries. Basil is a different story because um, you need the leaf, which is what they're eating for marketing. So we actually row cover our basil and just exclude them. And that seems to work the best. So some of the other combinations of pests and crops that were mentioned earlier include squash bugs on all squash varieties. And um, there was another one here, where was it? Um, hornworm damage on bell peppers. Okay, yeah, um, both of those I'm not super experienced with, um, but it would follow the same, the same pattern. Um, I always worry with common names like squash bug that we're talking about the same thing. And we probably are. Squash bugs are classic on cucurbits. Um, I do know, like we have squash bugs every year, but our planting sizes are big enough that they don't seem to cause a huge problem. I do know that in smaller planting sizes, squash bugs become a much bigger problem. Um, but unfortunately, it's not something I can share tactics with. Um, they do lay their eggs on your squash plant and those eggs need to hatch. So again, exclusion might be a really great option. If the adults can't get to your squash to lay eggs on it, the little, the young squash bugs can't be there. Um, what was that other one? So the other one was um, hornworm damage. Hornworm bell peppers. Yeah. I've never, we don't do a lot of peppers. We do a lot of tomatoes. Um, and this was the first year that I've ever seen even a handful of hornworm. Um, again, it might be size of a planting thing um, where we just do such a big planting that it's not a problem. Um, there are some pretty neat, uh, Par like natural enemies of hornworm. Um, and if you're able to scout for it early enough and find it when it's a little tiny worm, I'm sure some of the organic spray materials would work. The trick is finding it when it's really small and being ready to go right then. And then there was one other one that I didn't catch before, but um, someone earlier mentioned they had blister beetles bad in the past on their potatoes. Yeah, blister beetles is another one that I've heard of and I've kind of been reading the media reports of it, but I've not experienced it myself. Has anyone else um, maybe in the chat box experienced blister beetles and had any management strategies that, that seemed to help? And we also do have a little bit of dialogue going on um, between, so Christine shared an article on the rust fly and Laura wants to know what's the name of the parasitoid wasp for aphids on the hoop house. Great, I'm gonna type the name of the parasitoid. It is Aphidius colmani. Um, I'll type it as well. There it is. Thanks, Jennifer. Now the, the challenge with Aphidius colmani is it's, it's quite specific. So again, you need to identify your aphid, which generally is gonna mean sending your aphid to someone who at least has a hand lens, maybe a dissection scope so that they can identify it. Um, 
aphids, you can't really identify them based off color. You can have a whole range of colors and it can be all one species of aphid. It's more about length of the antennae relative to the body and how they're, um, they have two little spouts on the back end to let extra sap get out. And it's like how those look and are arranged. Um, so again, an experienced person can really help identify aphids and having a good identification is really important for using biocontrols like that parasitoid. So Dustin just mentioned Ooh. that hornworms glow under the black light so you can buy the hand black lights and then walk over tomatoes in the evening and find them relatively easy. Yeah, that's a great, a great thing. Um, there are other pests that are much, much easier to see at night. So like millipedes, which um, especially in a wet year can, can actually get to pest levels in vegetable patches um, and can decimate plantings of carrots um, or dill. Um, you really have to go out at night and look and see what's going on. Um, and I'm sure there are other pests like slugs are nocturnal. They don't have the protection of a shell. So um, it, if you have something damaging your crop and you don't see it, it actually can be a great idea to go out at night and see if you can see anything at night. How often do you go out at night or does it really just depend on the season and or the time of year and what you're seeing in your crops? Yeah, I usually, I really don't go out that much. I think it'd be fun to go out more, but I'm usually exhausted. Um, <laughs> but if I have damage that I can't attribute to anything, then that really motivates me to go out at night. Um, just try to f solve the mystery. Like what's going on here? I see this damage, but I can't see anything. Well, maybe it's happening at night. Sure. So we've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, does anyone have any other questions for Jennifer about some anything that she's mentioned um, in her presentation or things that weren't mentioned, but you're curious if she's had experience with? Follow up? And then Jennifer, did you want to, oh, so we do have a um, question. Any suggestions on promoting insectivore? So I think maybe you're asking about insects that eat other insects. Um, like, or it could be other, oh, um, no, I don't have any for those. Um, and then Carl says, it's a real and, challenge to stay a step ahead of the insect pest to prevent pest devastation on crops. Yeah, so I have had more exposure to um, things like uh, planting wildflowers in a strip or planting um, even flowers in a strip in your patch to host um, things like jumping spiders. Jumping spiders are those little black spiders. Um, they're fuzzy and they're often quite interactive. Like if you put your finger down near them, they'll look at it. Um, they're incredible uh, hunters of all kinds of different insect pests. So, um, they really do well with um, kind of those kind of insectary plantings. And that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, I don't have any familiarity with other things. Yeah, so planting sacrificial crops to divert the pest attention. Usually the way that's done Although I think it could work with deer, especially if you planted like a patch of sweet potatoes, they probably would stay in the sweet potatoes. Um, but usually the way it would be done would be like on cucurbits, like uh, straight cucumber beetles absolutely love blue hubbard squash. So you'd plant some blue hubbard squash, all your striped cucumber beetles would go there 
and decimate it. Usually the next step is to spray those blue hovered really intensely with a really good insecticide. We don't have great insecticides in organic um, that will really kill the striped cucumber beetle really, really well. So we can divert them, but then I think the last step for us, you're gonna wanna let them lay their eggs at the base of those plants. Hopefully the plants survive long enough to be able to host those baby eggs and then till it in when those eggs are still in the soil. Something like that. So we have to wait a little longer to actually kill the pest. Jennifer, do you have a slide with any contact information or a website for um, You know, early? I don't, but let me type it in the chat box here. And we do have another question from Dustin asking to diatomaceous earth work on cucumber beetles. And that'll probably be our last question for the night and we'll sign off. I don't have experience with diatomaceous earth on cucumber beetles. I, I don't know. Um, we have used it on onion maggot where we kind of layer it into the soil as we're hilling our leeks especially um, and we feel like that helps control onion maggot but I'm not 100% confident on that. It, I think what we see in terms of better onion maggot uh, results may actually just be natural cycles in the in the population anyways so um, I think you could drench the bottoms of your plants. The challenge is getting it down where those larvae will actually ingest it or get rubbed on it um, because they are, the eggs are laid down in the soil and the larvae are in the soil. So you need to get your diatomaceous earth actually down layered into the soil.